This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we turn now to the fight for public education, as the teacher strike in Denver heads into its third day. District and union negotiators worked late into the night Tuesday on a potential agreement, including a base salary of $45,800 a year for educators. That would be a $2,500 boost from their expected pay for 2019-20 school year. But the Denver Classroom Teachers Association is still demanding the district rely less on bonuses and instead focus on financial security for educators. Denver's teachers are striking for the first time in a quarter of a century. Their walkout comes just weeks after an historic six-day teacher strike in Los Angeles ended with victory for educators demanding smaller class sizes and higher wages. The actions are the latest in a wave of teacher strikes that began last year in Republican-controlled states like West Virginia, Oklahoma and Arizona. The strikes have brought renewed attention to the plight of the American public school system, which teachers say is under attack. We're now joined by a former educator who says the teacher strikes can help shed light on one of the largest public school scandals in U.S. history. Shawnee Robinson is a former first-grade teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, who was convicted for what prosecutors said was her role in the massive cheating scandal that roiled the school district and drew national attention in 2015. Robinson was one of 11 former educators convicted of racketeering and other charges. Prosecutors say teachers were forced to modify incorrect answers, and students were even allowed to fix their responses during exams. This is Judge Jerry Baxter. Speaking after the verdict was handed down, he ordered most of the educators immediately behind bars, an unusual move for first-time offenders. I made myself plain from early on, and they have made this decision, and they have, they have, they have not fared well. And, and I, I don't like to send anybody to jail. It's not one of the things I, I get a kick out of, but they have made their bed, and they're going to have to lie in it. And it starts today. Two of the convicted former educators turned themselves in in October to begin their prison sentences. Nine were sentenced to jail, but rejected sentencing agreements in order to appeal. 21 defendants avoided trial with plea deals. The case has fueled criticism of the education system's reliance on standardized testing and elicited calls of racism, because 34 of the 35 educators indicted in the scandal were African American. Shawnee Robinson has written a new book on the cheating scandal with journalist Anna Simonton. It's called None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed and the Criminalization of Educators. In the book, Shawnee Robinson writes, the dominant narrative that developed about the scandal rarely acknowledged the bigger picture. Federal policies that encourage school systems to reward and punish educators based on student test scores, a growing movement driven by corporate interests to privatize education by demonizing public schools and land speculation correlated to new charter schools springing up that was gentrifying black and brown neighborhoods across the country. We're joined now in our New York studio by Shawnee Robinson, who's still awaiting an appeal in the case. Also with us, Anna Simonton, independent journalist, editor for Scalawag magazine, graduate of the Atlanta Public Schools, co-author with Shawnee Robinson of None of the Above. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Thank, Thank you for you. having us. So you are appealing these charges. I mean, you basically uh, were charged under laws to get the mafia. Correct. I was facing 25 years in prison. Um, I was charged with racketeering and false statements in writings. So explain, lay out the story. Go back to 2013. Tell us what happened. So the APS cheating scandal was Atlanta a period, public schools. The Atlanta public schools cheating scandal was a period of time in which educators were accused of changing their students' answers from wrong to right on standardized tests. And so I was actually a teacher for three years in Atlanta Public Schools. And my second year teaching, I was a first grade teacher. And that later becomes the year in question. 2009. In 2000, yeah. right, 2009. And as a first grade teacher, my test scores actually did not count toward the district targets, which were benchmarks imposed by the APS School Board and administration, 
or the federal standards, which was adequate yearly progress. And so, in October of 2010, I get a phone call from a GBI agent, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, um, and he asked me to come in to, strangely, a, a mall parking lot is where I met him. And he tells me that there's been an erasure analysis done for the entire state of Georgia. 20 percent of the schools over the entire state of Georgia were flagged for high um, erasures. Explain erasures. So, the, the erasure analysis was basically looking at how many times a student, right, a student's went from wrong to right. Erases their answer right. and makes and it right. Right, goes from wrong to right, right. After a certain amount, it's, like, statistically improbable outside of human intervention. And so, the agent told me that, in my class specifically, there were high levels of wrong to right erasures. And he asked me, can I explain this? And I say, no, I can't explain this. And then he asked me, well, did any administrators or the principal ever place any pressure on me to cheat on my students' test booklets? And I said, no. And then he pulls out a pre-written voluntary statement form, which was basically saying, you don't have any knowledge about cheating, you didn't cheat, and he asked me to sign this form. Now, the thing about this form is that later it's used against many educators who signed the form. They were charged with false statements in writings, which is a felony. And so, teachers were really put between a rock and a hard place, because here you have a GBI agent. And mind you, there were no attorneys present. I didn't have an attorney present. And when they went into the schools, teachers were pulled from their classrooms and interrogated. So, there really were no attorneys present. And so, you have this GBI agent asking you to sign a form. Um, and if you don't sign the form, you didn't really want to become a target, you know. But if you did sign the form, you could potentially become a felon. Now, let me ask you, the entire investigation, it was touched off, wasn't it, by a series in the, uh, the Atlanta Constitution that began questioning the, the, uh, the percentage of erasures that they were uh, uncovering uh, uh, in their investigation? What impact did that series have on the general Atlanta community? And obviously, it touched off uh, the law enforcement officials. Right. And there were, at that time, I believe there were about, um, it was over about, there were about five schools on, across five districts. Um, and so, that prompted the governor to do a statewide investigation. And so, and just to even go into as far as, like, the widespread cheating is concerned, um, over 40 states in this country have had evidence of cheating allegations. 14 of those states, it was considered to be widespread. In Washington, D.C., there were 103 schools that were flagged for high, um, suspiciously high erasures or test scores. Um, so, this was actually something that was happening across the country. Um, so, we... What we can't figure out is why teachers in Atlanta were slapped with felony charges. Some of my co-defendants were facing prison sentences of up to 40 years. And, uh, uh, Anna Simonson, I'd like to ask you in terms of the broader picture. Now, this happens, uh, these indictments come down in the middle of the uh, Obama administration. President Obama and Arne Duncan, his education mm -hmm. secretary, were very much into performance-based measures of uh, of teachers and standardized testing as a as a way as a key way to measure whether a student is doing a good job. Could you talk about the pressures that were put on educators and not only the educators but their supervisors, their principals, and their superintendents during this period of time? Yeah, this was a, a long-running trend beginning in the early 1990s when high-stakes testing began to be utilized uh, in school districts like Houston's. Um, but it was really codified in federal law in 2001 with No Child Left Behind, um, which was signed by George W. Bush. Um, but Obama really continued the um, policies of No Child Left Behind in, in practice, if not in name. And one uh, interesting piece to this story is how our governor at the time, uh, Sonny Perdue, Use the same 2009 test scores to apply for a $400 million Race to the Top grant. So, Race to the Top was a grant uh, under the Obama administration that for um, states that could show that they were doing some of these education reforms that the federal government was pushing, so expanding charters, increasing high-stakes testing, um, that they could get federal funding. And so, at the same time that Sonny Perdue sends in GBI agents to the schools of Atlanta, uh, because he suspects that the 2009 CRCT test scores are fraudulent, he's using those same test scores to say, hey, look, our test scores are going up. And they did win that $400 million federal grant.
And Anna, why did you get involved with Shawnee in writing this book and none of the above? You, too, went to Atlanta Public Schools. Why was this so interesting to you? I did. I had to take these tests, and they were, uh, they were uh, a drain on the actual education that I feel like students should be getting in the classroom. They're, um, in my view, a waste of time. Um, but uh, more important is that my middle school counselor was actually convicted in this case. I, like many people, watched the convictions handed down, not having really followed the trial. It was an eight-month trial, the longest criminal trial, excuse me, in Georgia history. Um, and so it was hard for people to kind of understand what was happening as it dragged out. But when the convictions were handed down, it was, like, heartbreaking to see someone who I remembered, you know, being this, like, beacon <laughs> in my own childhood, um, along with these other teachers. And so when Shawnee reached out to me, it was just a wonderful opportunity to um, do something about it and try to tell another side of the story. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're continuing our discussion with the authors of the brand new book, None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed and the Criminalization of Educators. Journalist Anna Simonton is with us, as well as co-author Shawnee Robinson, who is the youngest of the 35 um, teachers and staff charged in this scandal. Juan? Well, I want to ask Shawnee Robinson about this whole issue of high-stakes testing, the impact that it has had on, on teachers, not only in Atlanta, but across the nation. As we now know, there was a huge parent movement that developed to opt out, and, and uh, many states, there were huge percentages of parents who refused to have their kids be tested constantly anymore. But what was the impact on, the, on, on educators uh, as uh, authorities and state legislatures insisted on raising these test scores and constantly testing? the kids? I actually think it, it was devastating, because teachers were constantly having to teach toward the test. And, you know, that can really stifle your creativity in the classroom. Um, and so, yeah, that's the main thing. And I look at other countries like Finland, who don't have high-stakes testing, who continue to outshine other countries with academics. Um, so just this push and this overemphasis of high-stakes testing, and even how it's led to racketeering charges, you know, um, I just think that it was blown way out of proportion. I want to go to. Uh, well, you well, no, up? no, I just wanted to ask in terms of some of the key figures. For instance, the the Atlanta superintendent of schools was also charged and eventually ended up uh, passing away before uh, yes. she could be brought to trial. Right? Could you talk about the impact on the individuals in this case? Um, and you know, I really did not know you're spe uh, referring to Dr. Beverly Hall. Um, I never met her. Um, pretty much, who I was in contact with were our principals. Um, so, as far as that aspect, you know, I can't really speak to Beverly Hall. Um, but I will say, as a first grade teacher, I wouldn't say that I've experienced as much pressure as maybe a third through eighth grade teacher might have faced, because my test scores did not count. But there was definitely pressure. Um, just from the educational policies and the overemphasis of high stakes testing. Let's go to Beverly Hall, <clears throat> the Atlanta School District's former superintendent. Among those charged was painted by some as the one who orchestrated the uh, test cheating. Um, you write in your book, Shani, uh, from the moment Hall was selected to lead APS, Atlanta Public Schools, in the spring of 1999, she was under a microscope. Everyone is watching her, wrote the Atlanta Journal Constitution from Governor Roy Barnes who's hammering out his statewide school reform effort to corporate leaders, college presidents and parents considering whether to entrust their children to the urban public schools. Hall faced up to 45 years in prison, but died from breast cancer in 2015 before going to trial. She maintained her innocence. Um, I then want to go to Dana Evans. Dana Evans is the former principal of Dobbs Elementary School, who was convicted in the test cheating trial. This is Evans on PBS NewsHour in 2017, responding to allegations that educators participated in cheating for financial gain. I got bonuses one year out of the four years uh, that I was a principal, and it was $1,000. And I gave more than $1,000 to Dobbs. I paid for kids' uniforms, and I paid people's rent and their gas bills, and it is offensive that that I would cheat for a thousand dollars. 
That was Dana Evans. Um, you both write in the book also about Donald Bullock, an educator who accepted a plea deal in 2015. In order to receive a reduced sentence, he apologized for his role. I, Donald Bullock, do hereby sincerely apologize to the students, my fellow staff members, parents, and the Atlanta public school system, as well as the greater metropolitan Atlanta community for my involvement in the 2009 CRC administration resorted in cheating or other dysfunctional acts. You both write in the book that Bullock, quote, endured the shame of reading an apology after maintaining his innocence for so long, only for Baxter to slap him with five years of probation, six months of weekend jail, a $5,000 fine, and 1,500 hours of community service. Anna Simonton, tell us what happened um, with uh, the different people involved, from apologies, plea agreements to, in Shawnee's case, she's appealing. Yeah, so uh, 35 educators were originally indicted. Uh, many of them took plea agreements, and many of those folks, their plea agreements required them to testify uh, in this trial. So 11 folks actually went to trial. And the trial itself was uh, nonsensical. So there were witnesses who recanted on the stand and said, actually, I um, just said what I said in order to get this plea agreement, and I never was under the kind of pressure that, uh, that I'm now supposed to testify against uh, my former colleagues about. So uh, additionally, witnesses were contradicting each other to the extent that the judge, Jerry Baxter, said perjury is being committed here daily. And yet he didn't strike those testimonies from the record. He didn't allow for a mistrial. Um, Everything was very much slanted toward the prosecution, six months of prosecution witnesses compared to a few weeks of defense witnesses. So by the time that the convictions were handed down and sentencing happened, um, Jerry Baxter had become emotionally volatile, uh, patronizing, and that's where we see him uh, demanding apologies, and not only that, but demanding that folks give up their right to appeal, which is really why many of the defendants did not want to apologize and yet were portrayed in the media as, um, we've heard the word provocative, as if they were flaunting somehow um, their moral obligation. But in fact, they would have had to given up their constitutional right to appeal. So those are just some of the things that made this trial incredibly unfair. And what about the sentences that Judge Baxter uh, handed out? What kind of a message did that send across the country to educators uh, uh, everywhere? An incredibly chilling message. Um, and his emotional volatility to, to, was to the point where he actually, uh, at first, uh, sentenced the school reform team directors, so these are administrators, with 20 years in prison, which was, or, excuse me, 20 years uh, to serve a fewer number of years um, and the rest on probation. But that was beyond what the prosecution was actually asking for. So uh, he was, yeah, he was just, like, slamming down the gavel on educators. And can you talk about the racial disparities in this case? 34 of the 35 people charged, including Shawnee, African-American. Yeah, and, and all of them people of color. No white teachers were charged, even though white teachers were implicated in the original Georgia Bureau of Investigations report. Um, another sort of example is how, at the same time that the GBI was investigating Atlanta public schools, they actually did an equally in-depth investigation into Doherty County schools. This was one of the districts that was flagged in the state's original um, statewide look at the erasure analysis. And Doherty County had uh, cheating going on on par with Atlanta public schools, according to the GBI. And yet the local uh, district attorney there did not bring any charges. And one of the big differences was that their superintendent was a white woman, whereas Beverly Lee Hall is a black woman who is a rising star in the field of urban education. Has anything changed in Atlanta public schools in terms of student achievement, in terms of how uh, tests are administered, and in terms of their sense of uh, modernizing and corporatizing public education? Um, if anything, this has reinforced the kind of corporate education reforms that uh, we feel contributed to the conditions that created the cheating scandal. Um, so the narrative was constructed in a way to say, look how terrible public schools are. They're rife with corruption. They're failing. We need charter schools as an alternative. We need more data-driven education instruction as an alternative. That's going to be the answer. And in fact, our governor at the time, Nathan Deal, 
introduced legislation on the day that the prosecution rested. So the media was full of, like, recaps of how, you know, horrible teachers were. He introduced legislation to create something called an Opportunity School District that was modeled on Louisiana's Recovery School District, uh, which would enable the state to take over so-called failing schools and turn them into charters. As a result of amazing grassroots organizing, that was actually turned down. But other similar reforms um, have been put forward to um, continue those attempts. You both document uh, in the book the history history of the destruction of the black communities of Atlanta because of gentrification, poverty, the war on drugs. How does this link to the cheating scandal? Well, in, in a broad sense, it poses a question, who is really cheating these children, <laughs> if we think about cheating in terms of a lack of opportunity? Um, and some of the same people who were involved in blowing this so-called cheating scandal out of proportion uh, have contributed to the harm of black communities historically. So Mike Bowers was Georgia's attorney general for many years, later was a lead investigator looking into Atlanta public schools. As attorney general, he was one of the main people pushing for tough-on-crime laws that um, vastly expanded mass incarceration in Georgia, led to generational trauma that students are now bringing to school. In his 1996 bid for governor, he called children super predators, black children, trying to drum up fear in his white voter base. And then a few years later, he's on the news, one of the most vocal people saying, oh, these poor children have been cheated by teachers. And, and Shani, what about the local elected officials? So, uh, Atlanta has always been seen as a progressive city with a considerable uh, African-American progressive political leaders. Where were they when all of this was happening? Uh, well, that's a good question. Atlanta has always been known as the city too busy to hate, so it's all about image. And historically, black and white elite have worked together to decrease any racial tension. And so, you know, it begs the question, why were so many black teachers, educators charged? You know, it's almost in a sense of, if you can make a situation look like it's more of black on black crime, you have, you decrease that level of racial tension. Um, but in our book, we detail Atlanta's history of displacement and destruction. Um, and so we feel that the criminalization of black teachers was just the next chapter in that legacy. Shani, talk about what happened to you, how this impacted you. Um, you were pregnant at the time? I was pregnant during the entire eight-month trial. And it was emotionally and mentally draining. It was also financially draining. Um, we were in court Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5. And, you know, just to—the most disheartening thing to me, the way it was portrayed in the media was that educators cheated on their children's test to get a payout. And so that's why it was, you know, this big talk about how we had cheated the children. The lead investigator on the case testified that bonus money provided little incentive to actually cheat. And so my bond was about $200,000, and it was one of the lowest. Others was— $200,000? Mine was one of the lowest. There were others that were in the millions. And so just the media portrayal of it, it was really making it seem like we had gotten all of this money. My school, we actually did not meet our targets, so I've never received one penny of bonus money ever. My test scores did not even count. Um, and I didn't cheat. On so, what grounds are you appealing? Well, the first step, and my attorneys have been working diligently on getting the judge to recuse himself. During the trial, right before the verdict was released, he told the jury, whatever your verdict is, I will defend it until I die. So based on his own words, we already know where he stands on this case. He also had a private conversation with the district attorney. And when that came to light, our attorneys asked for a mistrial, but he denied it. There was a situation where he even tried to assist one of my, um, one of the state witnesses with identifying one of my co-defendants. Um, there was a, a woman who was asked to identify one of my co-defendants. And so she started walking around the courtroom and the judge called out to her and said, you're getting cold. And so the woman turned around and started walking in the opposite direction. She never recognized my co-defendant and eventually returned to the witness stand. And so it's hard to believe that a judge can be impartial after doing so many things like that. Um, and he retired, and they reassigned our case to another judge. But somehow, this same judge, Judge Jerry Baxter, has been allowed to continue to preside over our case. You know, we began this segment by talking about the Denver strike. Anna, how do you see this story linking into this bigger story of teacher strikes across the country? 
think it's deeply connected. I think that um, some of the same conditions that are uh, sparking teachers to take to the streets and protest and, and to the halls of their capital state houses, um, these issues of privatization, draining resources from the classroom, these are all things that were driving forces of the cheating scandal in, in the way that the narrative was constructed to demonize public schools in order to further um, the privatization of public schools. Um, I also think that there's this, you know, in the sort of resurgence of this education justice movement, a focus on black educators in particular, with things like the Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action. Um, and so folks are really looking at um, racial injustice in the education system in a way that I think this case is sort of the epitome of. And the impact on charter schools in Atlanta? Have they, have they, have they grown since this? Yeah, there's been each year an, an increase, although the overall number uh, has not gone, gone up a whole lot because there's often one, new ones that open close. And so that's part of the problem with charters is a sort of fly-by-night situation. We just have 20 seconds. I know you're both presenting none of the above at CUNY Grad School here in New York tonight at 6. What message do you have for educators, Shani? Um, just to stay strong. And I just want people to know that the APS cheating scandal was a manufactured crisis that scapegoated black educators and distracted everyone from the real problems that are undermining public education. We thank you so much for being with us. Again, their book, None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed and the Criminalization of Educator Shawnee Robinson, the youngest of the teachers convicted in 2015. She is appealing that conviction, and journalist Anna Simonton, co-authors of the book None of the Above. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.